So uh, as you may know, your office network is a liability. Many corporate networks provide access to private, sensitive company resources like backend servers, uh, databases, PII, customer information. Uh, and you know, usually those are protected by authentication, making sure that only known users get on those networks, but not always. Uh, but let's say you do have one of those networks and uh, you've got authentication on it, but what happens if one of those devices gets compromised? So let's go to a completely hypothetical situation that would never ever happen in the real world. A contractor comes on site to install some updates in say your HVAC system or your point of sale system. Um, so he plugs into your network and he, you know, to a lot of your network security tools, he looks like any other IP on the network. Uh, a lot of your network controls just let him talk to other workstations on the network, uh, other networks across the network. Um, and, and life is good, he runs his updates. But uh, let's say you, know, you don't have your corporate security tools on that laptop. You have no visibility in there because his laptop's owned by another corporation. So you're just trusting that his, uh, his laptop is healthy. So let's, uh, let's assume the worst. Let's assume he got uh, some malware on his system before he came onto your network and um, uh, you don't really have any visibility there. Um, it starts spreading out across your network. It's talking to workstations on the local network. It's talking to other networks. It eventually spreads to your data center. Um, malware, you know, like a ransomware, that kind of stuff. Uh, really bad day, really bad day for you. Um, so with Lisa, we can actually prevent a lot of these attacks before they even start. So what is Lisa? It's the Location Independent Security Approach, as you saw on the first slide. Uh, security Approach originally created at Netflix while I was there. Uh, even though I've left, they've uh, encouraged me to continue evangelizing it, conv convincing other companies to use it. Uh, if you want another rhyme, you can think of it as zero trust for the rest of us. Uh, if you've heard of zero trust, uh, vaguely like Google's Beyond Corp, uh, it has, um, has some of those principles, where you're basically, you have zero trust in your office network. You assume it's been compromised and it's full of bad stuff. So instead, you're gonna trust healthy, authenticated devices and users. So to enforce that, you're going to have everyone uh, access all corporate resources over VPN. So things like I mentioned, the databases, the backend servers. Uh, and then deprovision your office network. Basically, remove any special access it has. Treat it like any other network out there in the world. Uh, you're, when you're on that network, all you get is internet access and access to the VPN. And you'll also put in place uh, device and network isolation so that devices on the local network cannot talk to each other and then networks cannot talk to each other from there. That helps limit the, uh, the blast radius of compromised devices. So assume your perimeter is weak and that it will be penetrated if it isn't already. Uh, you can't really use it in authentication decisions anymore. Uh, some companies solve this by putting authentication on wireless networks and uh, wired ports like I mentioned and having expensive security stacks with uh, inspection going on in every office. At Netflix, we want to step back and take a look at the bigger picture, uh, keep the office network simple as possible, and have all that uh, expensive complication and the security heavy lifting back at the VPN point of presence. Uh, and yeah, again, the main idea here is strong authentication and healthy devices. So when I say treat your network like a coffee shop, I don't mean fill it with bearded hipsters. Uh, I mean, use Lisa. Uh, treat your office network, network like any other network out there on the internet. Treat it like a, a coffee shop. You don't own it, you don't control it. Uh, it's, it's got bad juju in it, don't trust it. Uh, and actually many, secu security start or many, many startups are already subscribing to this zero trust model uh, the, without even realizing it. So you, know, you go rent a, rent a small location to get your startup going and it comes with a basic little network with only internet access. So to get access to all your backend servers, you're using VPN or some other you know, SSH or whatever method you prefer. Um, so yeah, the, off the office network itself has no privileged access. So let's go back to our contractor uh, we'll call him Bob. Um, so he's, he, when he's infected, he's not gonna be able to spread to the rest of the network anymore. He's basically compartmentalized. So he can't talk to anyone else on the local network. He can't talk to other networks. All he gets is internet access. Uh, you're basically, like I said, you're treating your perimeter like it's been compromised, compartmentalize it up, don't let anyone go anywhere. Uh, the architecture here, it's really not rocket science. Uh, I get a lot of questions, you know, where's the code that I can download? How hard is this to do? Um, it's really just changing your thinking and using commercial off-the-shelf software. I mean, if I can do this, you guys can do this, trust me. Uh, it's, you can use a lot of your existing infrastructure. Likely, if, if you have a VPN and uh, you know, you're doing two-factor authentication and, and health checks, you're already most of the way there, trust me. So, uh, as I mentioned, you're gonna funnel access to those private resources across, uh, across the VPN and then block lateral spread. Those are the two big things there. So on the bottom left, you'll see the user, and the first thing they hit are the, uh, the switches private VLANs, and that's what prevents users from talking from one device to another on the local network. 
Then from there, you go up to the firewall, and that's what prevents your, uh, your, your device from talking to other networks, or your network talking, talking to other networks. Then from there, you connect over to the VPN, and that's where your health checks are done, you know, making sure that your system meets corporate standards like uh, you know, an opping full of malware, having drive encryption, screen lock, all that sort of stuff. And then uh, it also ties in with your identity provider to make sure you are you know, an, an, an authorized employee and that uh, you, know, you do that, that two-factor push on your phone or you get that six-digit code to type in. And then from there, it goes through your, uh, the connection goes through your favorite network security stack, whatever you prefer. You know, if, you're, if you've got an IPS, statistical analysis stuff, malware analysis, what, what have you, goes through there, then into your, your private resources, and um, then out to the internet. So here's another way to view it, uh, kind of a higher level overview, where on the left we've got our user A again. All they get is internet and VPN access. Once they are on the VPN, they can then connect into those private resources, whether it's AWS or your data center. And then if they want to, they can come back down to resources in the office. Uh, on the right is an exception network. We'll go into that in a little more detail in a minute. So once lease is in place, these are the communications uh, and the blocks that you would put in place. So uh, down the bottom left there, you've got user A cannot talk to user B. That's the, uh, the switch private VLANs. In the middle there, you've got the network to network communications are blocked. That's with uh, just firewall ACLs. And then uh, the user talking up to your private resources in Amazon or your data center, that's put in place either with uh, uh, firewall ACLs or more importantly with, with removing any potential whitelists you might have in your ACLs or in your applications. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that later. You definitely want to pull any whitelists out of your internal applications. So endpoint checks, these are done by the VPN client itself. Like I mentioned, just checking to make sure you meet corporate security standards. You know, is your drive encrypted? Uh, do you have anti-malware tools on? Do you have screen lock on? Uh, and it's a gating factor, just like with identity. If you don't pass these checks, you can't get on the VPN. Uh, re remediation workflow is something to consider here because if the users don't pass this VPN check, they can't get it into corporate resources, which are kind of important. So you want to make sure that either IT has some sort of centralized way to fix the, fix the problem on the end user's workstation or have them remediate themselves. So implementation, actually fairly simple. Uh, collecting use cases, creating exceptions, and configuring the infrastructure. So collecting your use cases is gonna be the majority of your time. Uh, as, as you know, blasting out an email to the company doesn't always work so well. You know, a lot of people don't read it. Some people will reply, some people will reply and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So it really helps to, uh, as I found out, get out from behind your monitor, get out of your safety zone, and go talk to people. Go talk to directors, longtime employees, uh, the guy in the basement with the bearded suspenders. He's got all kinds of good corporate information. And, um, look at the org chart, look for interesting branches of, oh, this team might be doing something interesting that's, that's non-standard, let's go talk to them too. Meeting with these people and saying, hey, here's what's coming, here's how we think it might affect you. Let's work together and, and, and see what's, what's gonna happen for you and make sure that there's a, the littlest amount of friction possible. And then of course, hey, have you heard of anyone else that this might affect? Uh, you know, just doing that old fashioned gumshoe work following the, uh, the, the yarn uh, to, to other teams that, that might be affected. And uh, I think you'll find that, that uh, most, most companies, uh, most employees are actually okay with just internet and VPN access. I mean, they're already typically using VPN. Um, there might be some limited resources in the office that, that they're not used to, but uh, you know, they, once they get used to using VPN for everything, they're, they're good to go. Creating exceptions and exception networks, most cloud-centric shops will find that they don't really need many because pretty much all your resources, you know, like Google Docs and, and what, what have you, email are, are all up in the cloud, so you, it's your internet path, there you go, no problem. Um, when you do find exceptions that, that need to be made, I say with, with those workflows, work as hard as you can to try to adopt them to the Lisa model so that you have as few exception networks as possible because those exception networks are some residual risk for you. So um, creating these exception networks, it's basically just an isolated network where you know, one or two of the Lisa rules don't apply, like maybe you allow hosts to talk to each other, but you, know, you don't get to talk to the rest of the corporate network or, or all the resources of an Amazon. So you wanna offset, that, off that, offset the risk of that network with either limited access or increased monitoring or, or whatever your preferred method is. And then you of course wanna review access requests, make sure people are getting on this network for a legitimate reason, not just because, oh, I don't like VPN. Uh, and then, of course, track with your favorite method, like a spreadsheet or database or what have you. Uh, and then you can do some automatic deprovisioning of these, of these networks, or access to these networks, which is kind of nice. I'll get into that in a minute. So on the right, we've got our section network again. Uh, we've got uh, the user talking to a local device and up to some limited sets of, of uh, Amazon resources. The biggest use case for this, uh, we found at Netflix, was consumer electronic devices. So I don't know if you've heard, but Netflix has this app that runs on like TVs and Roku's and stuff, it's kind of cool. 
Um, so to help with development of that, uh, these, these uh, companies send their, send their devices on site to be tested. So, um, you know, the, the, but last time I checked, Samsung TVs and Roku's don't have VPN clients in them, so how do they get access to these, these resources on Amazon? So we created this exception network and uh, plug, plug in there, and then your developer on that network is then able to, say, SSH into the TV for debugging or screencasting or, uh, or having the TV pull down new code or connect up to test harnesses in AWS. So configuring the infrastructure, also pretty, pretty simple. Uh, if you've already got a VPN, uh, you're in good shape. You just make sure you're doing the health checks. You're tied into your identity provider, and you're doing your two-factor authentication. You know, if you want to Ping or Duo or any of those other popular guys, uh, use whatever you like, whatever floats your boat. And then setting up pilot networks so people can can test these can test these scenarios of like, oh, okay, well, here's my workflow. Here's how I think it's going to work. Let's just verify that, testing all that stuff. And then on the day of the, the cutover, actually putting the blocks in place, you know, putting in the uh, the host-to-host -host blocks, the network-to-network -network blocks, and uh, removing any potential whitelists in your, your applications and, and adding firewall ACLs. So automated deep provisioning I, I mentioned earlier. So this is to address residual risk of these exception networks. So, you know, if a user moves or, or leaves or wh whatever, their port's still live uh, where someone could get on this network. So what we did was wrote a, sc a script that talked to sw the switches and basically said, hey, what ports are on this, uh, this exception network? And then from there, we could trace back in the switch to, okay, that's this jack. And then from there, we could trace back to, okay, it's this cube. And then talk to the HR database via API. Thank you, Salesforce. Or no. Uh, the other one, uh, and say, okay, who's in this cubicle, and then uh, where, or what email address do they have? And then email that user once a month um, and, or once a quarter and say, hey, do you still need this access? And if they say no, you tell the switch to cut that port, or if uh, they don't reply, then just cut it off. So benefits of this. Uh, you get to become the lazy security person you've always dreamed about. It's so wonderful. Uh, you've reduced attack surface. You've significantly limited lateral spread, all that good stuff. Um, so things like tailgating, someone coming onto your corporate network getting access, uh, WPA2 vulnerabilities and bypasses like crack, uh, SMB worms like, uh, what was it, Eternal Rocks a while back, compromised IoT devices. Meh, whatever. Uh, if it's on your network, you don't care. It can't attack other devices. It can't attack your users. It can't attack your data center. Uh, if you wanted to take this to the extreme, you could have some real fun uh, and turn off all authentication on your wired ports and your wireless networks. Uh, all that anyone would get if they get on that network is internet access. They can't access any of your other resources. So with this uh, convenient choke point for access, authentication, and uh, inspection, you, you get some good benefits for IT and security. You get to know who all your users are, and you get an inventory of all their devices, and you know all their devices are healthy. It's, uh, a, a, there's a lot of good wins for, for IT there, having that visibility. Uh, a, a lot of, you also can simplify your network and get some cost savings there. You don't have to worry about a lot of the lower level network attacks and mainland in the middle stuff, doing ARP inspection, DHCP snoop, snooping, all that sort of stuff. The VPN protects you. You can get away with a basic switch and a firewall at your sites. Uh, all this, like I mentioned, all the heavy lifting, all the security intelligence is done back at the VPN point of presence. You don't have to have one of those expensive stacks at, at every office. You know, say you've got an office in Mongolia with five people, you can't, you know, spring the million dollars to put that security stack there. This will cover both your, your main offices and your remote offices. Easily implemented, everybody loves that. Uh, many companies don't have dedicated developers in IT to put all, you know, a bunch of custom code together, come up with some custom solution. So here you're just using commercial off-the-shelf software, like I, man, manage, or like I mentioned, bolting it together. There's really no, little to no custom development. Uh, and because of that, you're not tied to one specific sort of uh, supported vendors. You know, you can swap out your VPN provider, you can swap out your 2FA provider, you can go to town, uh, which fits with that to a lot of agile companies these days. And it fits more companies. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you've uh, checked out Google's Beyond Core, but a lot of people have been interested in that, but you know, it, it feels a little heavy-handed to them maybe. Uh, you know, maybe you don't have the levels of risk that Google does where you've got nation state actors coming after you. So you're not worried about, you know, if someone swip, swaps out the RAM chip in, the, in your laptop, uh, you're no longer able to get on the corporate network because security thinks that maybe your device is compromised. Or maybe you don't have tight endpoint controls. Maybe you're doing a lot of uh, bring your own device sort of stuff. So there's no easy way for you to push out a bunch of certs to everybody and manage all those certs. So in these kind of cases, uh, lease is more likely to fit. So some lessons learned. Uh, Top-down backing, you definitely want to get that. You, it's, you don't want it to look like crazy old security teams coming up with this harebrained idea it's, and it's going to affect everybody. You want the message to be coming from the CEO and the VP saying, hey, this is, this is a great idea. This is why we believe in it. Here are the benefits. It's going to cause a little minor friction, but really it's, it's not that painful. 
Um, and then uh, communicating, communicating out via memos, what have you. Uh, like I said, no, no email blasts that usually don't work. Uh, targeted emails to say, hey, Team X, we know you have use case Y. Let's meet and discuss this some more. Make sure we get you taken care of. Uh, flyers, uh, the bathroom is always a popular location, gets most people during the day. Uh, we had a Google group, we had Slack channels, we have a question and answer document, we had an internal website. Uh, we had town hall where people could come ask questions and throw tomatoes at me. We had office hours every week, and we had a war room the day of where uh, people could come and report issues. So just because you do all this communication, just be prepared. There might be one or two people that, that you miss. Uh, I know the day before, a big cutover, uh, somebody came up to me and said, hey, Brian, what's this Lisa thing I've been hearing about? And I said, you didn't see the emails or read the flyers or, or anything? He said, yeah, no, I saw the flyers. I just didn't read them. So I was a little sad that day. Um, and collaborating, collecting the use cases the hard way, like I mentioned, getting out there, talking to people. Uh, the email blast is not going to be so effective. Sit down with people, and, and you're going to have a much higher bandwidth conversation, much better chance of success. Uh, work closely with those teams that this most affects. Uh, make sure that their use cases are, do are documented and completely addressed. Uh, you know, make sure they, they're invited to your meetings, your weekly meetings. Uh, keep them on email threads, involve them in the, in the whole process the step, every step of the way. Make sure that they feel like they're involved, and that'll help get them on board. And then when other teams see that they're on board, they realize, oh, these aren't just crazy security people. They're actually trying to improve things. It's really not that bad. It's, it's not that much of a change for me. So all right, let's, let's get on with this thing. Some more lessons learned, uh, find, being thorough, finding all the access. You know, make sure, like I said, go through your firewalls, go through your routers, go through your security groups, go through your applications. Applications are the one most people don't think about, where you know, say you've got some, the, the traffic comes out of the, the public side of your, your office, and, and one of your public-facing applications says, oh, I see you coming from the office. I, I totally trust you, because we know that it's only good users there, so you can bypass auth, or we'll let you into this part of the application no one else gets to, like the, de the debug part of the application. So pulling that kind of stuff out. And just going over VPN. Um, and don't forget redundancy and circular dependencies, because as some of you may have guessed, if you're funneling everyone through one point, if that point fails, you have a bad day. So having multiple uh, VPN boxes, you know, in case one goes down, ideally having multiple locations as well. And then circular dependencies, you know, you don't want to have that chicken and the egg where, you know, your, your identity provider or your 2FA provider goes down. Well, if, you're, if they're down, well, then you can't get into the VPN, you can't get into the corporate resources. So, uh, you're going to want to have some sort of secure location on campus where you can bypass some of these, um, some of these restrictions in case of emergency, you know, like a, a break glass in case of emergency room. And uh, one thing people tend to forget is uh, printers and phones. So you know, if you're a traditional shop, your, your laptop talks directly to the printer, or a phone talks directly to the PBX. Uh, Netflix, luckily, we were fairly lucky. We, we had a Google Cloud Print and a, a cloud phone provider, so everything goes up to the cloud and back down. So no problem there. But if, uh, if you're not able to migrate to that, uh, you're, you're going to want a couple exception networks there. So next steps for you, like I mentioned, this is once you, once you kind of think it through, it's really not that bad. Uh, it's, it's not too complicated. You, uh, you go out and meet with, with leadership, you know, show them this presentation, uh, convince them that this is the right path forward, this is here are all the benefits, uh, and, and meet, with, meet, with, meet with them and, and have them start the message out. And then meet with the network team and, and the IT team saying, hey, what are our gaps here? Are there any things we need to, to buy? Or, or how are we going to reconfigure things? And of course, meeting, meeting and communicating with the users saying, hey, here's what's coming, here's why it's coming and when. Uh, gathering all those use cases, communicating the, the timeline, uh, and then doing the actual implementation, making sure your VPN is configured with the health checks and the 2FA and your identity provider. Uh, removing that office access is usually the big one is when the, the big cutover happens. And then, of course, testing along the way on those pilot networks to make sure there's no big, uh, you know, the building doesn't go up in flames on the day of.